getting this meeting underway, obvious continued pressure from the president. What happens? What happens tomorrow afternoon? Well, Alan Greenspan to PIMCO years ago when he visited us in Newport Beach, he described the Fed as the most collegial organization he'd ever witnessed. And when he joined the Fed in 1987, he was already 62 years old, so he had witnessed a lot of organizations. You could say that about the Federal Reserve and all its members, they're amongst the best civil servants in Washington next to the military. You should expect the Fed to be highly independent and do what it thinks is right for the U.S. economy. What it thinks is right this week will be a rate hike. But after three years of interest rate hikes, the Fed clearly is getting signals about the, where neutral is in terms of its policy rate, and it's getting closer to a pause, and markets then might be able to breathe a sigh of relief in 2019. Uh, so you think, what, March doesn't happen? What's, it's, what? the, the Fed will want, at this stage, to give as little guidance as possible and maintain so-called optionality to do whatever it thinks is right. Uh, so a pause does seem more and more likely, but it's not a certainty because pausing without stopping is something difficult to do, something Ben Bernanke describes in his recent book. Uh, the Fed will try to pause, but what if it wants to restart? Then it gets back into this quandary again. So it's going to be difficult, but there is a, the availability of more communications next year. Chair Powell will have eight press conferences instead of four and other means of communications perhaps to make the message clear. We'll get to Mark in a second, but I just want to ask you about PIMCO's forecast for 19. Uh, growth will slow to less than two, right? Uh, investors should stock up on lower risk liquid assets. Uh, you mean buy UK banks? How would you describe your outlook for next year? Cautious. Um, like most people, we think we're not so sure that there'll be a recession. The 2020 recession is probably the most widely anticipated recession in history. Everyone seems to be predicting it because of the length of the, the expansion, which will reach its longest ever, dating back to the mid-1800s sometime next year, around June. So we're cautious, and we would say that the best trade for 2019, the single best trade, not in terms of overall portfolio construction, may be the one that isn't in a portfolio today, simply because there's enough volatility to enable you, an investor, to go into markets at better prices relative to the fundamental value. So that single trade idea we can't give you. But we would say about UK banks that the market's pricing in excessive fears about the Brexit-related impacts, and, and these banks can handle a lot of stress, as the Bank of England Sorry, showed in a recent the stress test. You, you don't know. <laughs> uh, meaning there could be a lot of dislocation. There have been, and one, I can point out a number of them right now, in, it's in different on the corporations. Until an there are various corporations right now where corporate bonds, for example, bond yields have moved up a lot relative to treasuries. And so there's a lot of dislocation in markets. And that's what you want to take advantage of with the dry powder in terms of your risk budget in 2019. Mark, should the Fed take a pause tomorrow? Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, as, as Tony said, you know, maybe to quote, quote uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or to paraphrase them, you know, we're looking for a rose and a fisted glove for the hawk to fly with the dove, that maybe they hike, but then they do pause. And I think, as Tony said, the last thing they want to do is put themselves back in a box on saying when they would hike again, because I felt like the uh, Chairman Powell kind of put us, put the Fed into a box in October with statements that were more hawkish than the market liked. And uh, they, they should get back to the data dependent message, and that would really help the markets. So if the Fed does hike tomorrow, just to be clear, Mark, and then sort of changes its tone and talks up data dependence more, do you think that is enough to put a bottom in this brutal sell-off? Well, to say that we're going to bottom, I think, absolutely takes two elements here. You know, the, the Fed is one component, but also the trade policy is another. And I think the president... Uh, has been talking about the Fed's role in this, but we, of course, also know that the administration policy also has a role because it is starting to show up a little bit in the numbers uh, that the U.S. would like to see some of these supply chains unbundled, for example, and that would take some time to work through the economy, and that would slow growth a little bit. So I think both of those elements are needed to make things improve. But keep in mind, both of them should be incentivized. The, the Fed does not want to undo the work of three Fed presidents, and the President of the United States does not want to pursue a trade policy that throws the U.S. into recession at a time when he's trying to get reelected.
Tony, yesterday Scott Wapner interviewed uh, Jeffrey Gunlock. Uh, Gunlock spent a lot of time talking about the deficit and his concerns about it, even going so far at least in, 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 to, uh, to say or imply that the Fed should be keeping in mind that when it raises rates, it will increase the cost of debt and therefore $140 billion in additional interest costs in the U.S. budget, as though it's something the Fed should be worried about as well. That's not part of their mandate, right? It's not. In fact, one could go to the Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan organization, look at the budget outlook for the next 10 years, and it has it right on its website, and see that the interest costs in the United States rise dramatically over this 10-year span. But it isn't the Federal Reserve's job, so to speak. What would solve the debt problem is an increase in U.S. productivity. Uh, because what can't solve it is a change in the demographic story. Whereas in the past 30 years, we saw an increase of numbers of people to buy and, and produce goods and services of 1%. Uh, that's down to a half percent, likely to stay there for the next 30 years. Uh, so we're not going to see growth from that part unless there's a big change in immigration laws. Only from productivity, and that requires investment by the government or incentives by the government for companies to invest, to raise productivity, to raise incomes, and so we can well, pay our supposed debt. supposed to be what the tax bill did? Instead of generating, well, a, we've got a, other a, issues, an and, and what this has shown, uh, the recent experience is that it could be politics, not macroeconomics, moving financial markets. It's Brexit, it's China, it's Italy, all with potential binary outcomes in the first quarter of 2019. In fact, that markets are worried about. They have risks that markets can't fully measure, called Knightian uncertainties. There are certain risks that can be measured relatively decently. Think of an insurance company that can measure the uncertainty about automobile crashes today. But these are uncertainties markets can't grapple with, so they investors disengage. The likelihood is these become benign outcomes, but markets can't be sure. We can't be sure. One wants to be prepared, and you will leave a little money on the table by de-risking. But it's uh, probably the, if they are, these issues are solved, uh, we, it's likely that there would be enough momentum into 2020 that one could catch up. Huh. Mark, uh, one final uh, tactical, I mean, on a tactical basis, earlier in the week it was these lipper flows biggest flows into bond funds uh, since data began. Today it's the BAML uh, survey, largest ever shift into bonds, uh, global net underweight falls 23 percentage points. Does that feel capitulatory to you short term? I don't think we've seen uh, the big kind of capitulation that you know, we've had in other major sell-offs. Uh, certainly our clients are focused on their long-term financial plans, and that helps them get through crises like this. So it, any kind of deep capitulation I don't think we've seen, in part because this is a little bit of a different cycle where some of that political risk has bled into the markets but has these binary outcomes that Tony talked about.